episode of Oregon Life. Thanks for right? watching this episode, episode of, of Oregon, Oregon Life. Life. Hello, I'm Frank Caruso, and welcome to not just a brand new episode, but a brand new year of wonderful shows. So I'm at the Firefly, and often this is how shows happen. I see Rose Mulling on the wall. I see the artists there. I approach the artists. I talk to them, tell them about Oregon Life and they agree to be in it, as you'll see in this episode. I, these three lovely ladies, they're not just depth with knowledge of the history of Rose Walling, but they're amazing artists as they take us on the journey from a long time ago in their artistry, starting it, letting it go for a little bit, then starting it up again, and doing amazing work and a history and traveling to Norway. And then as I'm interviewing them, I'm asking them, so where, where do you get the, the, the plates to, to paint on and the ornaments? And they tell me about a man who's at the Stoughton Senior Center. Now this is a very unusual thing. As I did a little research and there's few uh, senior centers in the United States that have a woodworking shop, a full woodworking shop. Uh, as you'll see as we meet uh, him as well, as he makes these wonderful pieces for the rose maulers to paint. Coming up in this episode of Oregon Life. Hi, I'm Bonnie and I'm a rose mauler. I've been rose mauling for 41 years when my first son was born. And then as life goes, I took a break, went back to work. And then when my second son was born, I rose mauled then. And now uh, I've been rose mauling for probably 14 years more consistently. Um, I started because I lived uh, in the Stoughton area and saw all the beautiful rose mauling and really wanted to do it. So um, way back when they had an MATC class, I took it um, and so that's kind of the start of my journey. I just want to tell people not to be afraid of trying something new that you want to do. It's, it's possible if you have a passion for it. So um, lifetime learner, that's what I'm pushing. Besides classes that are offered in Stoughton, um, I go to Vesterheim, which is in Decor, Iowa. Vesterheim means our Western home. And it's a Norwegian American museum that's been running for many, many years. And they offer classes and they have great displays of rose mauling, carving, um, anything the immigrants brought from Norway. And I've been lucky to go on some Vesterheim tours. One tour was with Lila. And um, every time Vesterheim takes a artisan tour, they open doors that you don't get to see normally. Besides seeing great museums, you are, uh, are invited into f homes of people that show what their family made in textiles, in uh, carving, in painting, in weaving. Um, it just, it, they're very uh, gracious in teaching us the old ways. I started rose mauling in 1975, I think it was. And then I, I took my classes because I had a niece who wanted me to join her at a class at Monona. And I have, I rose mauled for about four years and when my son was a toddler he put his hands right in it and I knew then that I wasn't able to continue rose mulling because I was doing oils and it was smeared all over. I didn't paint until 2000 when Songerfest was in Madison and they wanted people to do trunks and I ended up doing 22 trunks for Sanger Fest at that time. Yeah, I have pictures of all of them. Um, and then I have kept on painting, but I had switched to acrylics at that time. And so I paint in acrylics and Bonnie paints in oil and Kim paints in oil, although Kim is doing acrylics now. It, 
there are two bowls that Bonnie and I painted in, at Vesterheim in Iowa to show the difference or the, how you can't really tell the difference between oils and acrylics when the paint is dry. We did not match our colors directly on those pieces, but later on we did another demonstration and at that time we did match our colors ahead of time so that the finished pieces looked very, very much alike. As Lila mentioned, we um, went to Vesterheim and did a demonstration on oil and acrylic to see how they look side by side and to let people know the advantages and disadvantages of the medium you're using. This, when you do acrylics, you pretty much can go like that afterwards. If you do oils, if you did this, you would totally smear your project. So. Um, and when it's all done, I don't think there's a lot of difference. So none of us have taken art classes in school. Um, we came to Rose Malling at different times, but we've all continued in it and truly enjoy it. I like it because I relax while I do it, and I'm focused totally on what I'm doing in rose mowing. Many times I can be in a room that people are talking around me and I don't pay any attention to what anyone else is saying because I'm thinking of what I'm doing. Um, Bonnie and Kim will both attest to that. <laughs> That's for sure, <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm Kim and I'm a rose mower. I started rose mowing because my mother wanted to take a class um, with Vi Thodi, who is one of the very beginning rose mowers in um, the Stoughton area. Um, also, Peer Lisney was one that was um, big in the Stoughton area, and Ethel Qualheim are three big rose mowers from um, the Stoughton area. And my mom wanted to take this class. It was at Vithodi's house in her garage, and um, I was pretty young, newly married. Um, my husband and I were going to farm together. We still do, but um, I had been a teacher prior to that, and uh, so I decided to go with my mother. Well, my mother lasted about three weeks, and she was done with rose mulling. Um, she had a hard time doing anything artsy like that and um, I took to it right away and by Thody took me under her wing and I was able to go to her house at odd times she'd call me up and ask me if I wanted to come over and um, rose mauled for about two two and a half years and then life happened where I had four kids and a career in teaching and coaching and um, Retired in 2016, and my first goal was to get back to rose mulling. Uh, the one way that you get better at rose mulling is if you spend quite a bit of time rose mulling. If you just go to a class and you pick it up one time a week, then um, it's a little more difficult to get real proficient at it. I, um, I do teach like a community ed class in Stoughton. Uh, my, my funny story to that is I was a phi ed teacher and one of the students in my class in the second time, second or third time that I taught it was our um, very, very proficient art teacher. He was amazing at art but had never ever painted in oils and I paint in oils and so he came to my rose mulling class. So the joke was the phi ed teacher is teaching the art teacher. One of my goals is to, you know, keep the art alive. And on Wednesday morning, us girls and a bunch of other people get together um, at the senior center and we all rose mull on Wednesday mornings. Also, um, my classes on Tuesday evenings uh, we bounce around between the Stoughton Senior Center and the town of Dunkirk um, Town Hall and Rosemall out there. I'm also in charge of the classes with another couple of people in 
for the Wisconsin Rose Mulling Association, and we bring in about um, six teachers every year for classes, and every single class is completely full. So my goal in um, Rose Mulling, I, I'm not trying to get my gold medal like a lot of people do. I just love the art, and I love um, the fact that more people can get involved. We need more people that want to rose mull and more people that would like to learn. This is a Roglin piece and it's a lazy Susan. What you can see in that is that it's symmetrical. You could divide it into halves or quarters or whatever. Some are five, but it will all be symmetrical. Everything will be equal. So this from this to this to this. Yeah, yeah that's the same there. So and the same here. Yes, and the little this. ornaments are also Rogland. And that's typical of uh, each, the style is symmetrical, whereas the Tina here is done in Telemark. And you can see the free flowing scrolls is what is typical for Telemark. Um, then this is a Grubin Stalin, but that's symmetrical again too. Um, but it's a different style if you look at the leaves. Bonnie did that and they're kind of <coughs> turned over on themselves. If yeah, you can so go it looks on. like the leaves are curled. That's one distinct yep. difference. That's a, and that's a very true to Grubin Stalin. Yeah. And, and that's. that's Go ahead. In the nor northern part yes. of Norway. It's, a, it's above Telemark Little Norway. Telemark is southern Norway, and the uh, Rogaland is in the area in which I was married, the southern lower area around where the oil fields are. So in rose mulling, we um, start out with the very basics of teaching our students what's called C strokes and S strokes because every stroke pretty much that we have is a C stroke or an S stroke. So if I am doing um, a C stroke right now um, around the outside of this, I'm doing my lightest value. There are three values to this. I am going to just do a C stroke around the outside of this and come all the way around if I can make it like this. But it shows up very well on here. You can see that this right here is a complete C stroke. Now this of course isn't finished and this only has one value on here right now. But this is a C stroke and off of the C stroke comes an S stroke. So everything that we do in rose mulling, whether it be as little as this leaf or whether it be as big as these scrolls, is a C-stroke or an S-stroke. Same with right here with what we're doing. It's a C-stroke or an S-stroke. Um, we have been talking about many different styles, and in addition to those styles are things like Nordfjord. And it comes from the different valleys of Norway. When they didn't travel very much, nobody knew what anybody else was doing. This is Seta style. This is more in the belly of Norway. And, it, and it's highlighted by the crown. And this is a lunchbox, which has stuff inside of it, sorry. <laughs> Little treasures. Um, so if you were taking this out into the forest, you would have your cheese and meat and bread, and then you would cut it on top of here. Okay. Uh, and this is Valdres. It's another valley of Norway. And it's a bouquet of flowers. This last piece is um, when the Laplanders used to follow the reindeer into Russia. They learned how to do mezzan painting. This is a Russian art. But th then they went back to Norway with their animals and they uh, painted the inside of caves. And they found these shapes. And um, so it's just kind of a fun thing, but it's good practice on 
uh, short line work and shapes and making things dance. And, and there's meaning behind this. I mean, on all of these, there's a cross hatching that is supposed to keep the evil spirits out of the ale bowl. So there's cross hatching here to keep the evil spirits out. And in mezzan painting, the the waterfowl on here are like the people that have died and lead us through life. And the horse is female, and um, there's there's many different meanings. But there's a lot of cross hatching here to keep um, the evil spirits out of what you're putting inside of this, so you don't get sick from it. So back then they kind of knew that there was something associated to good food and not having dirty things to put things. And they often um, um, have cross-hatching on lots of lots of different things because they feel yeah. like it wards off all of the evil spirits. I, we also have a friend of ours who on every single thing almost that she does, she puts um, three trees. She has a tree that's blossoming and growing and then she has a tree that is just a stump and then she also has a tree that is um, an older kind of a tree and it's getting to the end and she calls it um, the the past the present and the future yeah. and so um, the future tree actually is a small tree and the present tree is a larger tree and the stump is and the stump definitely. of course is the past and so that that is something too we see um, especially in that style of Valdris. Um, you'll see, do you have the chimoiserie on the outside? I do. Yep, and on the outside of this is the chimoiserie. Oh boy. Where you see buildings uh, and yeah, here, trees. Here, this is more <laughs> You can see some trees on there and mountains and buildings. We see chimoiserie, it's called, um, occasionally as well, especially in that style um, called Valdris. Yeah. From the Valdris area. The original did too. Goodbye. The Bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Mike Point. And I've been working here in the wood shop for about eight years. Uh, I retired in 2013, and my wife thought I was just going to sit around the house looking for something to do. And I said, no, I'm going to go down to the senior center and see what they have to offer, having never been here. So I came down and found my way down to the wood shop and got introduced to everybody. And they kind of took me under their wing, as we do with newcomers. And <clears throat> I said, I, I know how to use the equipment basically, but I'm certainly no expert woodworker, but uh, with their help and, uh, and guidance, I've learned a lot about wood and a lot more about how to use the equipment, how to repair the equipment, etc. And so now I'm kind of the supervisor of the shop. One of the uh, first things I got uh, involved with down here is working with the rose maulers. There's a group of ladies that meet every Wednesday morning, and most of them are very experienced rose maulers, and a lot of the things that they make uh, are little ornaments and stuff made out of wood, typically eighth inch uh, birch plywood and they would bring their little patterns over here and say, "Oh, could somebody cut these out?" for me, I need about 10 of them or whatever. I'd say, sure, I'll help you. So uh, that's when I learned how to use the scroll saw. Uh, one of the ladies brought me in a pattern. This is actually an ale bowl. I think she got this at Walmart or someplace, and she wanted a bunch more. So we make these out of uh, eighth inch thick baldic birch plywood. So I cut out a bunch of pieces say she wants 25 of them, so I'll cut out a bunch of blanks that the pattern fits on, and then I put four of them together and put little 
little dabs of uh, super glue around the edges so it's one solid piece. And then I just put it on here and trace with a red pencil around there. And then I have, and I, you know, drill the hole. So you wait till they're glued together before you drill the hole. Then the hole is in the right place on every single one. And then we take this to the scroll saw. And then we just turn this on, uh, and then I take this and I cut all the way around on the line. And then I have four of these. And since the glue is only on the edge, uh, none of the pieces are stuck together. So in one, in one pass, I can make four. Sometimes if it's a simple pattern, I'll, I'll put five pieces together, but four is pretty much the maximum because uh, the plywood's pretty hard. It's got a lot of glue in it and everything, so it's kind of hard on the blade. Okay, when I, uh, when I started making these uh, ornaments for the rose maulers and cutting them out, I quickly decided that it made sense to keep a pattern of each one so that uh, if, they, if they came back and said, yeah, I remember that Christmas tree you cut out? I'd like to have some more of those. So I would keep all the patterns. Sometimes they would bring in just a printed, uh, a printed pattern like this out of a book or whatever, and I would just make a Xerox copy of it and glue it onto a piece of uh, masonite and then cut it out, and that's the pattern. One of the rose maulers uh, had something like this that they use when they're painting uh, plates which, and Rose Mullers do a lot of plate painting. Uh, she brought one in and showed it to me. It was kind of primitive and wondered if I could make some more and kind of improve on the design a little bit. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll be glad to. So uh, the, this is just a round circle made out of, uh, uh, I think this is uh, poplar. And then uh, you probably won't be able to see it, but there's a little lazy Susan in here on the inside. So, so this can turn and it's got a little, uh, a little place here. So you set your plate in here and then you can turn this at a different angle and then use this little wedge to just pop in there and then it won't turn. So you can paint without worrying about the, the, uh, the piece turning on you. And this is also adjustable. You can have it anywhere from just about straight up and down all the way down in, in uh, increments all the way down to about there. So you can, you can get comfortable with what you're doing. So these were pretty popular. I ended up making about 25 of these or so. And it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of steps, but it, it's fun to make stuff like this. And they enjoy them. So... I was at a garage sale one day and I saw a little rocking chair and it was just made out of pine and it was all beat up and it had stickers on it. It was kind of ugly. But I noticed that it uh, folded up and I said, well, that's pretty cool. I think I'm going to, it was only a couple of dollars. So I bought it and I thought, I'm going to make some of those out of basswood and I'll bet the rose maulers could paint those up and make them beautiful. Uh, this is sized for a uh, a standard uh, American girl, 18-inch doll, which seems to be uh, kind of a worldwide standard for dolls. So I made a bunch of these, and I gave them to some different people, and then I asked them if they'd like them to be rose mauled or painted, and then I kind of uh, con contracted with the rose maulers to paint some up, and I've, I've given away a bunch of them. I probably made a dozen of them, but the neat feature is it folds up. I don't know how useful that is <laughs> to have a rocking chair for a doll that folds up, but I just thought it was neat. So, and again, I took the old one apart, took the various pieces and just laid them on the, on the basswood and then just cut them all out, sanded them down smooth, and then uh, gave them to the rose maulers and, and then they took over from there. So they'd put a nice design here and here and they're, they're very beautiful because 
the rose maulers do very, very good work. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching, watching us on, on Oregon, Oregon Life. Life. <laughs> <laughs> watching this episode of Oregon Life. Thanks for right? watching this episode, episode of, of Oregon, Oregon Life. Life. Episode of Oregon Life. Thanks for right? watching this episode, episode of, of Oregon, Oregon Life. Life.